have a special program and very special guests. And let me start with introducing uh, our, my co-host, first of all, uh, Janine Mitchell, uh, who has PhD in area studies uh, from University of Washington uh, with focus on Turkey and South Caucasus. 20 years of experience of working in the region uh, and uh, a professional, development professional uh, working in the region uh, with UNDP. Um, so Janine uh, is a new co-host of, of this program. So this is the first program that we will co-host, but there will be many more in the future. So welcome Janine. Thank you. I'm so, so happy to be here. Uh, and uh, so our guest today is uh, Professor Arman Grigarian, Professor of International Relations at Lehigh University. And we had the chance um, to uh, interact online and write together article uh, in Newsweek, but we never met uh, physically. So it's the first time we're meeting and we're having this program. And to my knowledge, I may be mistaken, but I have not seen uh, publicly any Azerbaijani or Armenian to meet after the uh, Second Karabakh War, except Aliyev and Pashinyan, and maybe some other uh, Armenian-Azerbaijan government officials. Yeah, but Aliyev and Pashinyan were not looking at each other, and we are. Yeah, and there, was, <laughs> there is no Putin between us as well. <laughs> there, is, there is that too. So that's the difference. Yeah. And uh, so, welcome, Arman. Thank you. You know, I have been um, following your interviews and your um, uh, your articles and your opinions uh, from international media to Armenian media to you know interview you gave to Ismail Jalilov, which I was looking yesterday. It was more than hundred thousand views, and I'm a little bit uh, envious of you and jealous because. I don't think there is any Azerbaijani scholar or anyone who has such, how should I say, audience in Armenia. Like, somehow you manage to uh, find a way to talk uh, about the issues, quite sensitive issues, that uh, unfortunately more divide us than unite us, uh, Armenian Azerbaijan. Um, and you have people in Azerbaijan who listen to you, and I, I'm, I'm really happy and honored that, uh, that our show is the first show we, we physically meet. Uh, but I've been following all, all your interviews and all your thoughts, especially after the war, and you sounded very optimistically. Uh, you were projecting um, like options, what Armenian government could do and what they should do and what rather they should not do. And the same about Aliyev and Azerbaijani government. What is, what would be great, you know, if Azerbaijan government does and what uh, maybe they shouldn't do if they want a peaceful development and agreement with Armenia and so on. Uh, so now many months left, uh, we have seen certain dynamics uh, in relations between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, I want you kind of uh, reevaluate your own assessments. Like how how do you think what you were expecting, and how it played out, and where are we now? Like, did did things ex happen that you were expecting to happen between in this relationship between Armenia and Azerbaijan? Well, first of all, thank you for the the kind words and the invitation, and the opportunity to speak to uh, the, viewer, the viewers of uh, Dahe Yaxhi. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful opportunity, and I think there should be more, more conversations like this. Um, now, regarding my, my initial uh, mood, my initial reaction to, uh, to the war and, and the things that I... I uh, I talked about during the interview with Ismail Jalilov and some some other some other venues. Perhaps saying that I was uh, I was very optimistic about the the prospects of of a speedy resolution of political of outstanding political issues, or even reconciliation uh, the the beginning of a process of reconciliation between Armenia and Azerbaijan as societies, not just states. 
I don't think I was very optimistic. I was uh, only cautiously optimistic in one sense, which is, you know, as terrible as wars are, they usually undermine and destabilize calcified ideas, institutions, ideologies, and they open up uh, new opportunities for people to evaluate things uh, from different perspectives and to, to understand what has been done wrong, what has been the, the, the cause of, of, the, of, uh, of the war. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's just the objective reality that wars have that consequence, even if wars are terrible and they should be avoided even if wars do kill people, but, but they do have, uh, they, they do uh, force societies to look at things um, from new perspectives. And, and if we can call it optimism, that's, that's where my optimism was, that uh, a lot of bad ideas, a lot of calcified institutions and I ideologies, uh, you know, we had gotten the opportunity to, to evaluate them. Um, at the same time, I knew that even though the war had, had uh, also revealed the true state of affairs as far as the distribution of power is concerned, and this is, I, I, I hate to get technical about this, but uh, you know, in, in the study of international relations, in the study of war, you know, if you look at it from the rational choice perspective, from the rationalist perspectives, it is argued that wars happen because conflicting parties cannot agree on the outcome before the war and when the outcome happens then it becomes easier to negotiate a, a peaceful solution. But this is, this is one of those cases where even though one could call the military outcome decisive, I don't think there was a decisive political outcome to that war and a lot of the outstanding political issues were not resolved with the ceasefire agreement, right? So, and, and we do have a set of political, political issues that are unresolved, the very uh, problem of the status of Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, which now the parties seem to be as far from each other uh, as, as, as they have been, the issue of the demarcation of the borders, and certainly the issue of the, of the passage to, to Nahijevan, which Again, even though it was mentioned in the ceasefire agreement, there wasn't a clear definition of what its status should be. And uh, now it seems like the Armenian and Azerbaijani sides uh, have different definitions of it. So there are quite a few problems that have, have uh, remained unresolved and new ones have, have arisen. And uh, I, I think for a variety of reasons that I, I don't want to, to have a monologue, so uh, we'll probably talk about uh, all these other issues later on, but for a variety of reasons, this war did not result in, in parties' positions coming closer and overlapping on, on, on the political settlement. Uh, they have remained far apart, and uh, this is why the tensions are, are as, as, as high as they are uh, several months after the ceasefire. So as a result, my even cautious optimism has, has waned considerably. And uh, it seems like in Armenia, you do have the, the kind of revival or the re-strengthening or the re-emergence uh, re-energizing re rather of, of people who have always maintained that no peace is possible with Azerbaijan and this is uh, we, all we can do is, is try to get stronger and, and resist and uh, perhaps perhaps th think about a revanche and as far as the Azerbaijani position is concerned it has hardened uh, after the war if you remember uh, my, my interview with with Ismail Jalilov, one of, the, one of the points I made was that Azerbaijan has two options now. One is to try and, and to beat Armenia to submission completely, which I didn't think was possible and I don't think it's possible even now. And the other one was, was to behave magnanimously as, as, a, as a victorious side and give Armenia as a state and Armenians as a society positive incentives to, uh, to strive for, for a peaceful resolution, um, uh, for, for settling uh, the outstanding conflicts. 
but uh, that hasn't happened. There have been some things done by Azerbaijan that have been especially wounding and, and painful for the Armenian society. Uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of people even who, who are inclined toward dialogue are, are reluctant to hold such a dialogue today in Armenia, especially because of the POW problem, which uh, you know, your, your audience should know that is a very, very painful problem in Armenia. And a lot of people were, uh, were shocked by the, the Victory Park in Baku and, and what it signified and, and signaled as far as Azerbaijani attitudes are concerned. So unfortunately, you're right that even my cautious optimism has, um, has uh, withered away a little bit. And um, I see these things and there is there's more of a hardening of positions, hardening of, of the rhetoric. And uh, I, I, I'm, I have a hard time thinking what, what must happen now uh, to, to change the atmosphere um, you know, appreciably and significantly. You know, uh, I remember when the moment when you, I think, went viral in, in Azerbaijan was the interview, and which I don't remember in which uh, it was Armenian newspaper, but it was translated into English. And the one uh, uh, sentence or one thought I remember, which I think uh, was very unusual for, for Azerbaijan audience to read, um, and I've known many Armenians, but, but it was coming from you. It was, you know, it was so obvious for, for, for people from Azerbaijan, but coming from you, from, you know, scholar who studies international relations, states, societies, their interaction between each other on global level, um, you were saying that, you know, Armenians' foreign policy should be based on reality mm -hmm. and uh, not on myth. Right, uh, because you need to measure correctly your power, your projection of power, and, and that's how policies are made. Yes. Um, and um, at the same time, you know, as in interview with Ismail Jalilov, but also I think in other interviews, articles, you have um, said that mm, the like, you know, you expressed, I don't know, wishes, advices, but you, 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 as you said just now, you know, if Aliyev, if Azerbaijani government would do this, you know, then this would be better. It would help, for example, more Armenians to be more open for dialogue, for, you know, some kind of seeking compromise with Azerbaijan and so on. Or if uh, Pashinyan's government would do this, this would help, you know. But here we are standing and we see that, you know, Pashinyan government obviously was not doing what you thought would be wise to do. And Aliyev and his government didn't do what you thought is wise to do. And it brings me to a thought that, you know, if we take that your realistic approach to this conflict as it has played out in last months, you know, it's one thing what we want, what we wish, and then it's another thing what happens in reality. Uh, let's have a little bit of, let's say, empathy towards Aliyev, which doesn't mean sympathy or supporting this, but um, uh, is a ruler who has, for the last 17 years in power, tried to negotiate and, of course, has been often in quite humiliating position. Uh, and uh, could not get what he wanted. Despite of international support, Lavrov plan, you know, all other uh, UN resolutions, etc., etc., it didn't work, okay? Um, and then he decided, for whatever reasons, because he made the right alliance with, with Turkey, some agreement with Russia, and... Um, considerable, you know, uh, military build-up over the years. So he decided to solve this issue militarily. So within 44 days, there was a victory. And from Azerbaijani perspective, 90% of the problem, uh, and it's still, by the way, <laughs> discussion in Azerbaijan because 
uh, opposition Azerbaijan says that actually this is not a victory, it's a horrible situation because now we have Russian troops in Azerbaijan. But uh, I think a lot of people just see, you know, there was a progress and this is much better than where we were before. So it is a victory. Uh, maybe not the one we want to see, but it's still, you know, much, much more than what we had. And so, you know, once Aliyev and the government of Azerbaijan and the state tasted that victory, um, if we talk about realistic approach, what is there? Why should Aliyev? And I'm not talking about, you know, because I think the rulers, they don't think in these categories, let's be nice to, you know, our enemies, let's be nice to our neighbor. Like, they have, I think, very, um, you know, very political, cold-blooded calculations about what can I get and how much I can get. And I think unless there is naked power or some other forces that can stop it, they just get it. As during the First Karabakh War, you know, Armenian government, Armenian state got what it could get and stopped where probably, I don't know, it couldn't get more or for some reasons, you know, that was negotiated uh, line. Now it's happening vice versa. So uh, Aliyev, in a way, is not doing anything different from what Armenian, Armenian leaders did in the 90s. So my question to you is, if we take your realistic approach, not uh, your or my or anyone else wishful thinking, mm -hmm. but really realistic approach. Where do you think all this is leading us? Like, because we obviously see that, you know, Aliyev is playing hardliner, so he's just trying to take as much as he can. I don't know, squeeze out the peace agreement out of Armenia, you know, if it can. It tries to, you know, um, the open these transport links, the connect through Zangezur corridor. And my feeling is, and correct me if you see it differently, it has, of course, Turkish support, but quite interestingly, I think there is also Russian support for opening this communication. So why why do you think Aliyev should uh, you know, behave differently? And do you think he will, I mean, I think by now we can see that he will not behave differently. And where will it lead us realistically? Like in next five to 10 years, what is there to expect if geopolitics is not going to change? Okay, so this is a question with uh, quite a few layers, and it's, it's going to take... We have time, time, you know, yeah. it's a long interview format. It's going so. to take me time, uh, time to respond, and also I need, I need to kind of think about the, the, the sequence of the, um, uh, of the elements of my response. So first of all, uh, I want to dispel one thing right away. I'm not thinking at all in categories of being nice, what would be morally right on, uh, from the perspective of Azerbaijan to do. Uh, niceness doesn't enter uh, my, my thinking uh, when, when I talk about magnanimous treatment of the victor. I think magnanimity is a very calculated and pragmatic approach uh, from my perspective even though uh, superficially it may seem like we're talking about um, niceness and, and uh, you know, moral justifications for certain policies. So that's number one. The number two thing is that emotionally I understand Azerbaijanis. Emotionally I, I understand Aliyev. Yes, uh, Azerbaijan has been in, in, a, in, a, in a terrible position in, in terms of uh, the in terms of the psychological, moral, and political effects of the defeat in the first war. And, uh, you know, one, one small deviation I'm going to make here is about how Armenia, uh, Armenia behaved after, the, after the, the, the 1994 ceasefire. Now, you're right that quite a few people in Armenia did not behave magnanimously as well, but there was some internal internal discussion in Armenia, there was some internal uh, wrangling ab about, about how to deal with that victory. And at least uh, uh, the president of Armenia, Levantel Petrosyan, uh, at the time, and uh, some, of his, uh, uh, some of his closest, closest people in the government, 
were, were quite aware of the dangers of humiliating Azerbaijan, uh, of uh, pursuing a hard line. They were people who uh, actually, it wasn't just about the war, the ceasefire, the, the kind of the terms of the ceasefire, the, the future future uh, agreement with Azerbaijan, political agreement with Azerbaijan, they, they were people who maintained a position since the late 80s, actually since before the war escalated, uh, shortly after the, the Karabakh movement and some reevaluations of certain aspects of Armenian traditional thinking. They were people who were very much and very seriously inclined toward finding a real compromise with Azerbaijan and real reconciliation because they believed strongly that uh, an, a truly independent Armenia, uh, a, a truly safe Armenia, a truly prosperous Armenia could only exist if it settles its problems with its neighbors. So this was not just kind of uh, even a, a pragmatic uh, political approach given the circumstances of the time, it was a deep ideological conviction of these people and uh, their vision for what kind of Armenia they wanted and it, it, was, it was an integral part of that vision that relations with the neighbors need to be settled and, um, and that's the only path toward, toward a truly independent and safe Armenia. Now, uh, you, you, your audience also knows, I'm sure, that uh, Ter Petrosyan uh, agreed to the OSC Minsk Group proposal for the settlement, for the phased settlement of the conflict that was uh, presented to the parties in 1997, but he wasn't able to, uh, to implement it because uh, it, it triggered a crisis and it ended with Ter Petrosyan's resignation. And what came afterwards is, is, is really, you know, uh, is more feeding of your description of Armenia behaving uh, in a hardline manner. And the position uh, hardened over time. If sometimes, well, in the beginning of that process, uh, the hardline position was, well, we would be ready to give back the, the territories, the districts outside of Karabakh proper in exchange for Karabakh's independence or annexation to Armenia. Uh, the, the later on, actually, it was quite popular, the, the position in Armenia that, you know, uh, we, 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 we shouldn't talk about any compromises at all. I mean, this wasn't everybody, that, but, but there was a significant segment of the, of the hardline, uh, hardline corner of Armenian politics which insisted that you know, not an inch of territory should be given back under any circumstances and that any concession to Azerbaijan is only going to whet their appetite and, and mean a, a, a war from weakened positions, etc., etc. So, uh, coming back to the issue of uh, how uh, uh, Aliyev and, and Azerbaijan should have behaved or should behave uh, now that Azerbaijan is on the victorious side and, uh, and, and uh, Armenia uh, has been humbled basically on the battlefield. Uh, again, I can certainly empathize with, with Aliyev and uh, with others in Azerbaijan. I think uh, emotionally it's understandable. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is something that I usually uh, talk about to the Armenian audiences. The, you know, what I say depends on the audience I, I address. So uh, sometimes you have to uh, talk about different things to Armenian and Azerbaijani audiences, but in this case, I think it's it's um, it's a good idea to point out that I have criticized uh, the the Pashinyan administration uh, for being even more hardline after they came to power than the previous administrations, in the sense that they they in effect pulled out of negotiations, right? So. Uh, aside from the humiliation thing, I do understand, and I, again, I'm, I've, this is no secret and uh, uh, this is not something that I'm, uh, I'm telling for the first time to an Azerbaijani audience, 
but I have argued that uh, Pashinyan's diplomacy essentially forced Aliyev into a corner. And uh, it, it, he, he basically either had to accept the status quo or escalate. And um, escalate is, is what he did. So I understand all of, all of those things. I understand the emotional, uh, the emotional state, the emotional reaction, uh, the, um, the, the need to, to celebrate that victory after so many years of what the Azerbaijani society felt as a, as a humiliation. But uh, it's one thing to understand it emotionally. It's a totally different thing to evaluate something as strategically wise or unwise. Now, perhaps it is not strate strategically so unwise, and perhaps I'm mistaken. And, and perhaps the logic from the Azerbaijani perspective that now that Armenia is, is weak and this might not last forever, right? we have a window of opportunity and, and we need to extract as much as we can while Armenia cannot resist it. Uh, maybe just purely from a, a realist pragmatic perspective, maybe that's the, uh, the, uh, the understandable and even the correct position. It is, Azerbaijan certainly wouldn't be the first state to behave that way. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is an argument to be made in favor of, of the following point. No matter what Azerbaijan does, uh, it's not going to be allowed to completely beat Armenia into submission. It's not going to be able to, to destroy Armenia uh, completely. Uh, countries like Armenia or Azerbaijan are never allowed to do things like that in the international, uh, in, in the international arena. These are not, uh, you know, these, this is the weight category of countries that don't get to do things like that. Now, if Armenia cannot be completely destroyed, uh, you know, what are the other other kinds of Armenias. What, what are the Armenias, the future Armenias that are possible from the perspective of Azerbaijan? Uh, well, the, the one Armenia that, is, uh, that can be easily imagined if it undergoes a lengthy period of this kind of pressure and forced concessions and, and whatnot is an, uh, is an angry uh, Armenia uh, that um, that is striving for revenge, that is thinking about uh, the next opportunity and that is uh, going to do everything in its power to rearm, to become more powerful, to find allies, to exploit, <coughs> to exploit whatever problems may happen in Azerbaijan in the future. And, uh, <coughs> You know, certainly that will not be in Armenia, where uh, people who are in favor of peaceful re relations and reconciliation are going to be very popular or very relevant politically. The second kind of Armenia that is possible as a result of this kind of policy is an Armenia that essentially compromises away its sovereignty and becomes a military garrison of some third uh, party, most likely Russia. And I know for a fact that neither Turkey nor Azerbaijan are very enthusiastic about such a prospect. I think, uh, and it is understandable, I think um, for Azerbaijan and for Turkey, uh, the, the preferable Armenia is, is, uh, is, 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 is one that is, um, you know, really independent and really sovereign. And, and not simply a strategic instrument of, of another country or a garrison for, for, um, for another country. So uh, when I say that uh, Aliyev's policies, perhaps there is an argument to be made for uh, the more magnanimous approach. Uh, my, my analysis is based on these considerations rather than considerations of niceness and I'm not also criticizing uh, Aliyev's policies from the perspective of it being uniquely evil, unprecedented, etc. Et As I said, uh, Azerbaijan would not be the first country to, to behave the way it does after a victory. But uh, I think it's, it's worth asking the question, is that really the wisest policy or perhaps, perhaps um, 
there is there is cause to think about about alternatives. But uh, two things I want to uh, I don't know like to challenge you on. You said, for example, you mentioned that you know nobody will allow uh, Azerbaijan you know destroy Armenia or beat Armenia. You know from Azerbaijani perspective, yeah. you know from be it Aliyev, be it opposition leaders, civil society leaders, or anyone I know, um, the, from a Azerbaijan perspective, what Azerbaijan wants, and always stated, is not destruction of Armenia. Like, it is actually a very simple, for Azerbaijani mm -hmm. mind and soul, desire to draw the line between Armenia and Azerbaijan, which, you know, we believe is everyone accepts, the entire world accepts, except Armenia. Mm -hmm. So that's something that, you know, um, uh, first of all, is, I think, what Azerbaijan wants. And if I observe it correctly, and I may be wrong, but uh, everything else, what comes after that, as a threat, as a show of force. Um, and we can talk about things that happen in, you know, uh, Sunik uh, mm -hmm. slash Sangezo region and so on, demarcation of borders, etc. This is coming, again, we're coming, if, if we look at Aliyev as a, you know, pure Machiavellist and, uh, you know, hardcore, hardline politician, so it has an explanation. This is a threat, this is, a, and that's what he does in his rhetoric, you know, every day almost that, you know, if Armenia doesn't do this, then things will get even worse. So, uh, and I'm not saying this is right or wrong or what consequences it will have, but if we want to understand this politically, this is what it is. So that's why, you know, for example, I think, you know, a lot of Azerbaijans, when they hear this, so, Azerbaijan wants to destroy Armenia, like this is, is just not on the table. Like is, 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 is a fear, is like, you know, the idea that there will be second genocide, that, you know, someone wants to come and to destroy and kill all Armenians completely. I think I totally agree with you, this is impossible. But these kind of, you know, thoughts, they shape policies, they become state policies, they become the arguments for, you know, circle of uh, crazy decisions that reinforce each other. So that's one, one comment I want to make. And second, uh, when we talk about, uh, uh, you know, Russia's presence in Armenia, uh, I totally agree with you. I think neither Turkey nor Azerbaijan wants to see Armenia as, you know, Russia's garrison. But don't you think that it has already happened? Well, to because that's how it's seen from, I would say, from Azerbaijan. Okay. You know, that's uh, and is this are, are are you know Azerbaijan's mistaken about this? Uh, so it could get worse. Or where are we with that now? It probably could get worse. I, I agree to a certain extent that Armenia's sovereignty and independence has been uh, you know compromised significantly as a result of of this defeat. Uh, but it could get worse, and also you know if if Armenia were to feel safer, uh, then uh, Armenia's positions could change. I'm, I'm not talking necessarily about kicking Russia out of Armenia, etc. But, but again, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very dynamic process. And the less dependent Armenia feels on, on Russian protection, the less need for that protection exists. Uh, the more sovereign and, and, uh, and, and the more free and, and uh, you know, the Armenia's behavior and Armenia's place in the region will be, you know, appreciably different under, under these circumstances. But, but you're right that uh, after recent events, um, you know, Armenia seems to have uh, lost quite a bit of its ability to even conduct its own foreign policy. A lot of it has basically to be agreed to be agreed um, and verified with Russia. And um, yeah, uh, th there isn't much else to say about that. 
uh, with regard to um, your first uh, challenge. Now, when I say destroy, I don't necessarily mean the complete physical destruction of Armenia. I'm talking about uh, essentially reaching a, a situation where uh, Armenia is, is, is completely incapable of having any disagreement with anybody, with its neighbors, and uh, essentially it's in a position where it will, it, will be, it will do what it's told to do and whenever it has any conflict with its neighbors, uh, it's, not, it's not a negotiated solution but an imposed one, right? So I'm, I'm talking about destruction in that sense, political destruction where a country has lost all ability. Not to physical destruction. No, not physical destruction necessarily, although I have to make one, one caveat here. I mean, people like Armenians are, are very sensitive to these things, given their history, and maybe at times it seems hysterical to, to, to outsiders, maybe sometimes it seems hysterical to me, right? But uh, there is something to be said about, um, about the fact that, uh, you know, it's in the... It's not. It's not. Uh, it's. It's only a hundred years ago that something like that happened to Armenians, and it's not acknowledged. It's not properly uh, recognized, and uh, in fact, uh, Turkey essentially has the position that uh, either of, of denying it or of um, of seeing it as the consequence of of Armenian rebel activity, etc., etc. So, anyway, I don't want to, to get too bogged down in this, but, uh, you know, that kind of sensitivity among Armenians uh, is not completely abnormal either. No, but, but again, I'm not talking about physical destruction. A lot of people who, who think or who evaluate Aliyev's policies in, in terms of, you know, beating Armenia into submission, they're not talking about physical destruction, but putting Armenia in a position where it essentially is incapable of saying no to anything, right? And uh, Aliyev has said certain things that suggest such motives and such intentions. For example, uh, the several statement that statements he has made with regard to, well, why does Armenia need to have an army? Why do they need to reform their armed forces and to have the ability, you know, to, uh, to defend themselves? You know, they are not under threat. If, if they do what is necessary, you know, for, uh, for, rec uh, for uh, you know, settling the conflict, then I don't see why they need to have an army. In the meantime, Azerbaijan's defense budget next year is going to increase by a larger amount than the entire Armenian defense budget is. Uh, that's not serious. I mean, that's not how international politics works. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's about, you can't, you can't really seriously claim that if Armenians don't have bad intentions, they shouldn't fear us and they don't need to uh, create any ability to, to defend themselves. And it's not necessarily a matter of assuming bad intentions from, from your neighbors. All you have to assume that you might have conflicts in the future. Neighbors always have conflicts. So that's one point. And, and it's not just Aliyev's statements about, um, uh, you know, Armenia doesn't need to have to have an army, Armenia doesn't need to rebuild its army, it's, uh, which, which, you know, in, in Armenia it's, it's accepted and rightly so as a very ominous and, and a very, uh, very menacing signal. The second thing is that even though, even though he phrases it kind of carefully, right, uh, he sometimes makes uh, very unfortunate statements about uh, Yerevan and, uh, and uh, Sevan and Zangezur being uh, historical Azerbaijani lands and we will return there. And then when he is forced to explain what he means, he's like, well, there was an Azerbaijani population there that was forced to leave and I'm he, talking... He says he doesn't mean militarily, but like as population. He, okay. he said it several times. Yeah, I know. But he plays with it, yes. which will come back to the yes. threat. So this is yes. the behavior of Just, a if we're hardline politician. If, if we're talking about empathy, now I That's want, I want I, no, no, no. I want the Azerbaijani audience to uh, put themselves in the Armenian shoes 
and uh, think about what Armenians feel when Azerbaijan's president uh, talks about Yerevan being uh, an, uh, a historical Azerbaijani territory and we will return there, right? So these, these are, uh, I think, calculated statements and they are very menacing and they do nothing uh, to, to de-escalate the situation or the rhetoric or to create uh, an atmosphere conducive for a different kind of conversation. So uh, it's, again, to, to just sum up what, what I, I have, and you know, there were other things that happened after the war, perhaps more, I mean, I already mentioned uh, the POW issue, the, um, uh, there was one other thing. Uh, yeah, the, the, the issue of, of that uh, Victory Park, uh, all sorts of photographs with, uh, I mean, that, that I, I have to say that surprised me because I, 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 I've always thought of Ilham Aliyev as a, as a, as a much more, uh, how should I put this, um, as, as, a, as more of a statesman than somebody who was capable of standing on, on a road sign uh, written Armenia on it and he's like standing on it and he's, he's being photographed. I mean, this is, this is stuff that doesn't, doesn't help um, in, in creating a different atmosphere for negotiations or for even a, a conversation between our societies. So uh, I don't think it is sheer paranoia in Armenia. Uh, I don't think it's pure misinterpretation of Azerbaijani motives. And one last thing I want to say in this regard is that, um, you know, sometimes we all have this tendency of uh, looking at our interests, right, and interpreting it from a perspective of some abstract principle, principle of justice, principle of morality, principle of political international law, etc., etc. We do have a conflict over, over certain issues. And I think it would serve both Armenians and Azerbaijanis. Uh, it would, it would, um, it would be a good idea for both Armenians and Azerbaijanis uh, to put aside this mode of thinking where, well, it's, it's a principle of international law, uh, territorial integrity, um, you know, and Armenians are in violation of it. Armenians are demanding a revision of that, of that, uh, of, of uh, Azerbaijan's uh, territorial in integrity and uh, justice is on our side, international law is on, on our side, uh, Armenians just, just should cease and desist and there should be no conversation, there should be no negotiation and especially now that we have the military victory, there is nothing to talk about and, and our cause is just. Uh, did you notice that the Azerbaijani de delegation recently visited northern Cyprus? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, uh, what was uh, the the principle there? Territorial integrity? No. Two, yeah. two nations, one so, state. So, we <laughs> two and, states, and, one and, nation. And I'm not I'm not just I'm not just uh, uh, accusing the Azerbaijani side of this kind of thinking, or the Azerbaijani society of this kind of thing. Armenians do the same, right? Uh, they they're not talking about Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, especially to neutral audiences, as uh, well. It's uh, it's something that is a disputed disputed land and it has an Armenian population and uh, you know we have a historic connection. We we want to integrate Nagorno-Karabakh uh, to to Armenia or see it uh, become independent of Azerbaijan because that's what we want. That's how we see see our interests. No, they talk about the principle of national self determination, right? And then the same Armenians don't visit northern Cyprus, right, to defend the national self-determination, right, of, of the Cypriot Turks or, or, or the Chechens or whatever, right? So you can see that, the, I mean, we all have this tendency of, um, uh, you know, uh, getting too, too self-righteous and thinking that we're defending a principle when we're defending interests. And as, as soon as we realize that we're defending interests, not principles, 
and that sometimes these interests are in conflict, it will be easier for the two societies as well as for the states to, to, to approach it from more of a bargaining perspective, from a perspective of finding some kind of formula, a solution, which would you know, satisfy the minima, minimal demands and minimal uh, grievances of both sides, rather than just uh, think about that in terms of a principle which is totally zero sum and you know, I'm right and you're wrong. So I'd actually like to continue on this point of trying to catalyze a conversation between uh, Armenian and Azerbaijani societies. And of course, you know, you've touched on this issue of uh, self-determination, which is a very sensitive one, but also you've talked about the rhetoric of political leaders. This is obviously very important, very influential. At the same time, is there something that can be done to start to foster the, this dialogue and conversations between societies, um, given the status quo when it comes to political rhetoric on both sides? Well, it is, I mean, in principle, uh, of course there are things that can be done and should be done. Uh, it, it, is, it is very difficult to do. Um, so, so, the war itself creates its own problems and consequences, right? So the war sometimes hardens identities, the war uh, hardens grievances and hardens hostility. Um, but um, but even, even with all those consequences and, and all the atmosphere we have between these two countries, I think uh, those of us uh, who uh, who think uh, that reconciliation is desirable between Armenia and Azerbaijan, uh, at least uh, normalization of relations is desirable between Armenia and Azerbaijan, um, must try to, to think about this in, um, I, I don't want to say creative terms, because what I'm about to say is not, is not a total new invention. But, but it must at least try to, uh, to change their approach to certain things. Um, I'm going to borrow a, a phrase that Emin likes to use in this context. They, they, they might want to try kind of a new software for, uh, uh, for organizing, if not their relations, but, uh, but organizing their conversation. So there are a bunch of assumptions uh, that are prevalent within both societies and these assumptions should be questioned and we should shine some light on these assumptions. The first thing I already mentioned, right? Uh, the first assumption is that our cause is just. This is a matter of principle, right? Uh, and uh, the other side has a completely illegitimate completely outlandish, uh, evil set of intentions. And, uh, you know, it, you can't talk to people like that. You can only fight them, right? Well, as I said, uh, y you know, the, the, the Azerbaijani um, activists or uh, politicians who think this is just a p matter of pure principle, uh, recently visited uh, Northern Cyprus, and it seems to be at least a, a slight compromise on, on, on that position, right, on that commitment. Uh, Armenians, uh, it, it's also not any secret, are, are staunchly pro-Greek on this issue, right? And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure if uh, Yazidis of Armenia or Azerbaijanis before 1988 demand its self-determination in some pocket of Armenia that, that where they had compact, compact settlements, I don't think Armenians would be, you know, celebrating the, the right to self-determination and, uh, you know, um, helping these people gain their independence or, uh, or reunification with, with Azerbaijan. So this is, again, a call for empathy. Uh, uh, don't do this. Don't, don't think about it in terms of principles. Uh, these principles are useful sometimes for codifying things, 
for talking to international audiences, for defending your cause in international fora and you know for propaganda. It's all understandable, it's not it's all normal. Beyond that, when you internalize it too much and start seeing the, the, the completely reject any legitimacy to the positions of the other side, and when you deny them any empathy, uh, uh, that that just just kills the possibility of 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 changing that software and and having a different kind of conversation. And empathy is not agreeing with Absolutely the other not. side. Is empathy is not even sympathy. Empathy yeah. is the ability. To, to, to see things from the perspective of the other side, even if you disagree with it, even if you reject it, but it's an attempt to, to see it from the other side's perspective. And, and just rejecting these, these easy attributions of evil intentions, evil motives, evil character, and that sort of thing. Speaking of evilness, I mean, this, there is a second assumption that is made both by Azerbaijanis and Armenians, that there is something uniquely cruel about the other side and it's easy to make that point uh, by referring to things that both sides have done to each other, right? Armenians will remember Sumgait and Baku and uh, you know Azerbaijanis will remember Khojali and uh, you know the, both sides have mistreated POWs in the first war and the second war and uh, you know, committed war crimes. Uh, and it's easy to cite that stuff and say, see what they did, right? And sometimes it's even hard uh, to respond to an angry person who, who cites that evidence and shows you pictures of uh, you know, severed heads and tortured old people, etc., etc. How can you even not think that the other guy is evil, right? Except when you take a step back, and uh, look at it not just as an Armenian or an Azerbaijani and not think that this is the only conflict that has ever happened in the history of humankind, you realize that most wars, if not all of them, are accompanied by, the, by these sorts of horrors. There are no clean wars, there are no chivalrous wars, there are no chivalrous nations, right? All of them are, are accompanied by this sort of, all conflicts, I mean, you, you can go look at, the, at, at what the Croats and the Serbs did to each other, what Israelis and Palestinians are doing to each other, what, uh, you know, what the Georgians, we're in Tbilisi now, what the Georgians and the Abkhaz did to each other, I mean, it, it was no picnic either, everywhere, uh, I mean, the most civilized and uh, the, the most advanced of nations have, have committed the most uh, horrific acts, the Belgians in Congo, the French in Algeria, the Germans uh, uh, against the Herero, and then the Jews and the Gypsies and quite a few other groups of people. Uh, the British colonialism is, uh, is uh, you know, uh, drenched in blood up to the eyeballs, and, you know, we're all bad. I mean, we, we, we shouldn't make this assumption that only the other side is bad and, uh, you know, they are, they, are, they are unique in that sense, right? So there is a third assumption that uh, I think would be, would be important for Armenians and Azerbaijanis to make. Uh, and this is related to something I already, I already mentioned earlier. We're not going to finish each other off. Nobody's going to let us do it. We're going to be here, leading next to each other forever. Until the sun runs out of energy, uh, or, or, you know, uh, significantly long, e even, even if not up until that point. Uh, so, this may be a trivial statement, but actually, we should, we should think about what this means. If we're going to live with each other for a, le a very long time, living next to each other, and we're not going to be able to get rid of each other, do we really want to have a kind of relationship where we fight a war every 30, 40 years and, and kill a generation of, of young men and return to, uh, the, to the same situation and uh, you know, get ready for the next war? I mean, we have to realize that no, nobody is living for Mars and we are going to be here and uh, we have to find a way. Now, I understand that, you know, saying we have to find a way is much easier than laying out the actual parameters, but I do think that this realization is important, that we're not going to finish off each other 
uh, and uh, we're going to be here next to each other for a very long time. And this is no way to live, right? And uh, also, you know, I do know, I mean, as, as I said, especially after the war, which, which, which hardens positions, hardens identities, hardens grievances, creates new ones, uh, it's, it's hard to think about this. It's hard to have a perspective on it. But uh, if you look at the European history, our conflict is nothing compared to what the French and the Germans did to each other. Uh, to what the, the Germans and the Poles did to each other, to what the Russians, well, actually Russians and the Poles still don't like each other. But anyway, so there are, there, there are relations now, especially in Europe, and we all look at Europe as this uh, wonderful place where people have a much more civilized relationship. Well, th they had a pretty bad history and they have, uh, they, they still have the memory of these, these, uh, these, this history. And, uh, you know, they get along fine. Uh, their, their conflicts are at the level of soccer matches and jokes and stuff like that. And, you know, they cooperate. They, uh, they even like each other, I think. And, um, you know, thinking that because we've had this conflict, because we've had this war, then we're stuck in it and there is no way out of it is, is also a form of... Um, uh, think, having a tunnel vision and, and, and not, not being able to put things in perspective. This is not unique in history, this is not unique in the world. If the French and the Germans can get along, uh, we should be able to figure it out too. Mm -hmm. You know, this uh, issue of learning to live together and to rebuild and create a mutually beneficial context uh, in, in which everybody can live in peace and prosperity side by side, makes me think of development and the importance of international development for, for helping to rebuild, but also the role of international actors. And obviously, you know, I know that both of you have written an article together on the importance of the US, for example, engaging in the region. But certainly there are other actors that could engage, perhaps have not, um, Perhaps they didn't feel like the time was, was ripe or that, that they were ready for it or that the parties were ready for it. But now that we are at this critical juncture where it is high time to start thinking about redevelopment and start thinking about a mutually interdependent future, what, what are your opinions on how international actors, such as the U.S., but perhaps also development agencies or, or international uh, donors should be, should be engaging? Yeah, uh, I, I, I will give a, a slightly convoluted and complicated answer to a, a question that uh, begs for a simple one. Uh, and it deserves a simple answer, but in this case, it's, it's not going to be a simple one. So first of all, uh, I think there, is, there has been a, a, a certain perspective, especially among Western uh, academics and, and pundits and organizations and uh, uh, people who have, been, uh, who have been dealing with conflict resolution um, in the Caucasus or elsewhere. Um, there is sometimes an assumption that conflicts are stupid. They happen for no good reason. These people don't understand their real interests. Conflicts obviously have detrimental economic consequences for these societies. Why are these people fighting? Now, I do reject that. I think this, this perspective, uh, as I said, which is popular in the West and some, somewhat lacks self-reflection, uh, it's not like the West, Western countries or Western societies where these ideas come from uh, have not sacrificed economic interests for, uh, for other interests. And no, I mean, there, there is no reason to think, uh, there is no, um, um, I mean, there is no a priori reason to think that uh, economic prosperity or economic interests should have priority. Uh, people can have can rationally have preferences uh, where other things are more important than economic prosperity. 
So from that perspective, you know, I, I, I want that I want to say that and to put that in, in, in the proper perspective that I, I don't think I don't think the conflict is one where Armenians and Azerbaijanis simply don't understand what's good for them and that's why they have engaged in, in, in this uh, senseless violence. Uh, they should focus on economic cooperation and just uh, you know benefit from it and uh, they will all be better off. The conflict has been real, the conflict ha has been over something important for both societies and they have consciously uh, and rationally uh, decided that there are, there are things that are more important than economic prosperity. Now having said that, I think uh, creating economic incentives and economic interdependence between Armenia and Azerbaijan is, is very important. I think creating positive incentives for cooperation is very important. And I've been repeating this mantra since uh, the end of the war last fall. Uh, it may seem uh, obvious, it may seem uh, logical to think that the conflict will be politically settled as soon as the cause is removed. And the cause of the conflict is the status of Nagorno-Karabakh. So we have to leave everything aside and concentrate our efforts on finding a formula for the status of Nagorno-Karabakh, which will satisfy both Armenia and Azerbaijan. Now, it has always been extremely difficult to come up with such a formula. It's even more difficult now. I don't think, I don't think in principle we can find uh, a formula that will be minimally satisfactory simultaneously for both Armenia and Azerbaijan. It's, it's possible to imagine that such a solution can be imposed and probably Armenia is the more likely target of such imposition. But if we're talking not about imposition but a settlement, right, where both sides will accept it. I don't think at this point the, the two societies are ready and this is one of the interesting facts about, um, about the current situation because wars usually end up uh, resulting in a political settlement but the war again has not, has not, uh, has not made such a settlement uh, uh, obvious or, or easy. Uh, if that's the case, um, and as I said, I've been, I've been talking about this uh, for several months now, uh, I think the, the correct approach should be to focus on normalization first, normalization of relations uh, first, and, uh, and uh, just suspending the, the conversation, not the conversation, but suspending the the talks about uh, the status of Nagorno-Karabakh. Now, uh, I know this is, uh, this, this is not a popular view in Azerbaijan, and uh, I, I, I don't think that's, uh, that's something that uh, Mr. Aliyev will be very sympathetic to. I mean, after all, he says that uh, it's settled. There is nothing to settle there. Karabakh is, uh, is part of Azerbaijan, and there is nothing to talk about. But there is something to talk about. I think uh, we all know that it's not settled. Uh, but I don't think we should, we should focus uh, on settling, uh, settling that issue before normalization. I think we should, we should focus on normalization uh, and uh, creating positive incentives. And once these societies have built a certain level of trust, uh, a certain set of positive incentives for cooperating uh, and they, they have stopped fearing each other as much as they do now. Uh, I, I hope and I think uh, the conversation about the status will, will be easier. If not easy, at least it will be, it will be easier. Now, uh, the last point I, I will make in response to your question is uh, the role of international actors. I think it's an important one, but here also we have to be uh, to, to make uh, an, an important point, and that was a point that we made with with Amin in that news, Newsweek article of ours. Um, if major important international actors see this as an arena of competing for influence, 
uh, then we're all in trouble. Their involvement might not help things, it might actually make things worse. If, on the other hand, there is a, there is a concert of countries or a concerted effort by, by these major actors, if everybody decides, and I don't think it's impossible, uh, I think uh, one, one can describe a picture where they all might be interested in settling this conflict, uh, then I think it will be very important. But again, I think it, it bears repeating and emphasizing that any third party involvement that entails you know, competition between these three parties um, is, is something that, uh, that we should be worried about. But again, like on the other hand, we say we want no competition, but there was competition mm -hmm. for centuries. And I think there will be for centuries to come. And we are these, you know, two small countries. Yes. You know, I think, you know, we need to try to survive and ride the wave. And if we survive, we, are, we can consider ourselves lucky. I want to make a step back, you know, into, um, you said that, you know, Aliyev is making a mistake. He's actually, instead of uh, behaving graciously, magnanimously, you know, he is actually uh, doing something that, if I understand correctly, is strengthening the revanchist forces in Armenia. Uh, even if that may not be intention, but doesn't matter. I mean, I, I trust and He you. might as not care about as, it. Or he doesn't care about it. No. So that uh, is one thing that's happening. And I didn't say it was a mistake. You didn't say I, it was I, a mistake. I, it, was, no. uh, it was undesired it's, it's not, choice. I said it's not obvious that that's the, that that's the correct policy. Uh, there are alternatives to it, but, uh, you know, uh, saying it... Uh, you know, characterizing it as a flawed, mistaken policy probably would be would, would be too strong a characterization. But okay. but I think there are alternatives which uh, let's which talk need, about alternatives which, which need to be considered. Let, let's talk yeah. about alternatives uh, from yeah. perspective of uh, yeah. people who are in power in Azerbaijan because yeah. they make decisions, not me or you or. Yeah. Um, so, to. Uh, I think it's very it's a really unique situation. Like you and me, we we, we will uh, we have you, and we want to tell us as much as you can to explain to uh, hopefully also people who are uh, you know in charge of policy making in Azerbaijan, but also a uh, larger society, the political landscape in Armenia after elections. Mm -hmm. uh, because assuming you know, Aliyev did some moves and he's observing what's happening. So he's looking at Armenia after elections. So I think, first of all, let, let's start with explaining what is the landscape, uh, political landscape of Armenia after elections. And then we can come to the you know, other questions that I have in mind. So I, I was hoping you wouldn't, be, you wouldn't ask me that why? question. Why? No because, no, because I think if we want to move further to trying to, you know, analyze what Aliyev's or Azerbaijan choices would be, you know, then I think it's important to understand, and we can also uh, speak about the political landscape of Azerbaijan, but I think it will be more boring. Yeah. But uh, there is quite diverse political landscape, and I also don't want to talk about just party politics. Yeah you know, which we, we should talk about, but also about different narratives that there are in Armenian society, which I think is very important for Azerbaijan audience to understand and for Azerbaijan government if we're talking and want to discuss some policy options at all. Okay, so... After elections. Yeah, the political landscape after the elections. First of all, it's probably an interesting question that uh, might or must seem puzzling to Azerbaijanis as it seems puzzling to uh, many others as to how could uh, not only Nikol Pashinyan uh, be re-elected and, and the political force he is the leader of, but uh, be elected with a landslide essentially. I mean, it was, it was a victory with a massive margin. 
given uh, the, the, the catastrophic war and, and its consequences, and given the fact that a lot of people in Armenia, and I think I'm on firm ground saying this, a lot of people who elected him, who voted for him, uh, consider him responsible for, for this catastrophe. So how, how, can we, how can we explain this phenomenon? Um, now a lot of people in Armenia and outside of Armenia have, uh, have had an emotional reaction to this. A lot of people in Armenia ha who, who didn't vote for Pashinyan and uh, who were upset by the result have argued that you know, our people have gone crazy and they have lost their dignity and how could, we, how could they have re-elected this, this, this failure of a man, this person who was responsible for one of the most catastrophic pages of Armenian history. Uh, but that's not the right way to think about this. I think Armenians were uh, faced with uh, a very unfortunate choice. They subjectively regarded the choices between Nikol Pashinyan, who they thought, or at least a significant portion of the electorate that voted for him thought, was a failure, uh, was, uh, was responsible for that disaster, but he is the most credible obstacle against the restoration of what they thought was neo-feudalism, which is how um, the the years of power of Robert Kocharyan and Ser Sarkisian are perceived in Armenia. So, one, again, th there, is, there is no external metric or measure which you can use and say this was the wrong choice. Uh, essentially, a lot of people thought that their choice is between electing uh, this, uh, this government with all of its flaws and uh, and uh, all the catastrophes that they're responsible for and returning to, to what they thought the feudal order, which they thought was much worse than this, right? And, and I want to emphasize this. There is no uh, external measure by which you can say that's the wrong choice. That, that is rational from the perspective of, of the electorate and it's, it's morally also not, not very easy to say, yeah, you should have, you should have elected those guys even though, uh, you know, uh, you, you suffered 20 odd years of, of corruption and humiliation under their rule. So this is, this is the, the one thing that is important to understand and I, I, I know there is always the question of why there wasn't a third choice I was just wanted to yeah. make this Alaverdi question to you yeah. because I wanted to ask you, like, you know, there are experts in Azerbaijan who say, look, there was no real election. So actually, Kocharyan was the, you know, it was such a, such a gift, such a present to Pashinyan. Yes, because he was. for Pashinyan to win, yeah. the only way for him to win was to have Kocharyan as his this was opposite. So there are, I don't know if it's conspiracy theory or not. You know, I've not been in the room where it happened, but you know, the, it was almost like it has been agreed between Pashinyan, Kocher, and Moscow that that's how it should be. So my question to you: Do you do you think there was some kind of the conspiracy around it, or and and if not, but why there was no third force? Because anyone could win against Pashinyan, actually. I mean after what happened, okay. or not? Um, well, obviously not, but yeah, uh, I, I see what you mean. Um, uh, I don't think there was a conspiracy in the sense that Kocharyan and Pashinyan and... So and Kocharyan was serious, he wanted to come to power. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. But it was, what is true is that this was uh, an election of competing negative ratings. Basically, people were voting for Kocharyan because they were voting against Pashinyan and people were voting um, for Pashinyan because they were voting against Kocharyan. That's, that's the story of, of these elections. Perfect and election for yeah, Pashinyan. Yes. Uh, now, why wasn't there a credible third alternative? 
especially since uh, uh, Petrosyan and the Armenian National Congress entered the process um, in, on May 16. And uh, if you think about it just purely from the objective perspective, I mean, this was uh, the one politician and the one political force around him uh, that had been absolutely right on the issue of, of Karabakh and uh, predicting this disaster and, and prescribing policies that would avoid this disaster and, and having been in favor, in favor of a peaceful and compromised solution, uh, which now in retrospect seems like uh, you know uh, much much more preferable i mean it's not it's not even it's not even comparable to the outcome of the war so anyway they they, they have been proven right uh, by by the events and uh, and they were the only only political force and and certainly ter petrosian is uh, is a uh, you know heavyweight in Armenian politics with his experience, and he had a very good team of uh, of a mix of experienced and, and young intellectuals and professionals. So that was that was a very attractive attractive team, and in ideal circumstances, they not only they should be a credible third party, they shouldn't even have a competition. Uh, given, given what Armenia had experienced and, and given how everybody else had been proven wrong. Uh, so why did Levon Terpertesan didn't lead the opposition from the very beginning and... Okay, so um, Levon Terpertesan after uh, the war. feared after the war that any form of activism on his part or on anybody's part was risking serious destabilization in Armenia, possibly a civil war, and that uh, uh, all responsible parties should, should avoid uh, doing things that would increase the likelihood of such a civil war. Now, I'm not going to discuss whether his analysis was correct, whether it was exaggerated, but this is something that has been... Uh, uh, but he also has been cons consequent about this for years. Consistent. Consistent, yes. sorry. So yes, consistent exactly. So he has been consistent about this on, on numerous occasions where things have threatened Armenia's domestic stability. Stay he clear. has uh, essentially withdrawn from active political struggle. Um, he has supported the, the government even uh, when uh, he has had serious disagreements. For example, after the terrorist attacks in the Armenian parliament in 1999, I mean, Kochanya was the guy who had deposed him, right? Who had uh, been one of the leaders of, of that velvet coup in Armenia in 1998. Uh, but after the, uh, the terrorist attack in the parliament, you know, there was, there was a lot of... Uh, you know, uh, activity and expectation that their Petrosian should uh, take charge and, uh, you know, there was also a pronounced hostility from the army against Kocharyan because our, the army was more closely connected to Vazgen Sarkisian who, who had been killed in that terrorist act. Uh, their Petrosian immediately issued a, a, a statement uh, right after the, the, I think it was the next day, essentially, of the attacks, calling for everybody to rally around the president and the, the legitimate authorities and, and just uh, nipped it in the bud and, and didn't allow for, for these conversations or for this kind of, for this atmosphere to develop any further. And he has done the same thing uh, on numerous occasions. And uh, after the war, I think the, the main the, the, the main worry he had was that a, any powerful re-entry into politics at that point might risk destabilizing the situation. I mean, and also it would look like opportunism. This is opportunism. what happened in a way in Azerbaijan in the 90s. You know, yes. There was kind of civil yes. war, coup d'etat, and that yes. you know, weakened so, okay. Azerbaijan. And, yeah. Yeah. But, but the price of it was essentially uh, this, this thing that happened in Armenia where, you know, even though right after the war, uh, 
everybody had kind of realized uh, how the dominant approaches and ideologies had been flawed and are responsible for this catastrophe and how this man who has been warned against this but being called by the hardliners and the nationalists all sorts of names and, and labels he's been right and uh, you know he had given a couple of interviews in 2017 uh, before the, the elections then and uh, all of a sudden these interviews were revived, the interest in these inter interviews were revived and hundreds of thousands of new views of, this, uh, of these interviews which itself was an indicator of how much interest was in what Der Petrosian had to say and a lot of people, I mean, just anecdotally you would talk to people and they were like, oh my god, you know, uh, turns out he was right and I have been a person who uh, who has shared the, the, the common, common opinions and perspectives on him and I was wrong and we were all wrong and he was right. And the, the, this sort of mood was, was palpable in Armenia after the war. Uh, but it was clear that if, if Der Petrosian did not exploit it, if this was not fed somehow politically or intellectually, you know, his opponents and, uh, and the existing establishment and, and everybody else uh, actually was, was essentially invested in the old ideologies, responsible for this outcome, they were going to create a new na narrative, a new mythology, and they did. Every, and, and so Pashinyan's uh, standard opponents uh, talked about, you know, uh, treason and betrayal and, you know, his, his decision-making, which was secretly this or that. Pashinyan himself started uh, cultivating, or people around Pashinyan started cultivating myths that the war was inevitable, uh, the decisions of Pashinyan had nothing to do with it and it would not have made a difference. It was some kind of a Russian-Turkish conspiracy against Armenia, blah, blah, blah. So you created all this new mythology and one thing you have to realize is that uh, these are all people who have tremendous resources and uh, including media resources and they're also very savvy on the, on the new media and social media. And one thing that is true of Der Petrosian and, and, and his team is that they're terrible at PR, uh, terrible at propaganda, uh, terrible at engaging their opponents on, on, on these terms, right? Uh, they, they kind of uh, have debates like intellectuals, like academics, rather than like, you know, politicians and operatives. And also he just, he simply didn't have the, the resources and the media presence to be able to systematically fight uh, this, this new mythology essentially. And, and then he re-enters the, uh, uh, the process on May 16, uh, the Armenian National Congress uh, decides that they are going to participate in the elections and uh, there wasn't enough time uh, to do it, uh, and most of the electorate just wasn't wasn't aware of of Ter Petrosian's presence or Ter Petrosian and, and the ANC, the Armenian National Congress, being a real credible third alternative. You already had this kind of narrative that it's it's between Kocharyan and uh, and Pashinyan, and uh, it it proved too difficult to break that narrative. So that's, that's basically the story. As far as the current landscape, landscape is concerned, now you have a political force in power in Armenia uh, that clearly is not engaging in the same kind of belligerent rhetoric as it did before the war, right? But on the other hand, it's not, you know, whatever they say about you know, peace with neighbors and uh, settling the, the conflict doesn't have the same credibility either for the Armenian society or outside, right? Because everybody understands and perceives it as the consequence of defeat rather than conviction. And that's not good, right? Uh, moreover, they're not consistent. So it, it, at one point they will talk about, you know, peace with neighbors and we can't, uh, we can't, fight forever and uh, 
you know, we have to, uh, to find a peaceful resolution. Five minutes later or five days later, they will issue a statement about, uh, you know, that is from the old belligerent notebook. And, uh, you know, everybody is confused. As far as uh, the main opposition is concerned, uh, Kocharyan and Sarkisian, who are now going to be represented in the parliament, well, what, what can I say? I mean, Kocharyan and Sarkisian actually, after the war, have did start criticizing Pashinyan on the grounds that he's, um, his diplomacy was reckless and too belligerent and too irresponsible. And they even protested that they are perceived as proponents of this not an inch of land ideology. Uh, we've never said that. Uh, we've always been in favor of territorial compromise and what Pashinyan did was reckless. Now, this was a revelation for a lot of people because, you know, they're saying this after the war. And even if they have thought that honestly and, and, uh, and sincerely, well, the political forces they led uh, never deviated from the not, not an inch of inch of land ideology. So, who know? And I mean, what's the what's the value in in whatever they are saying now, whatever they may have held in their heads? Uh, in essence, uh, then uh, you you have three politicians and three political forces in the Armenian parliament, elected to the Armenian parliament, uh, that are primarily responsible for that war and uh, for its catastrophic outcome. I think Pashinyan more so than the others, but others are also responsible for it. And uh, uh, nobody who had warned against that policy, um, who had advocated a different approach, uh, made it to the parliament, which, which which is which is quite bad. I don't know if that's what uh, you wanted me to talk about as far as the political landscape is concerned. If 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 there is there is more to your question. Yes, no, no. You you answered the question it, that yeah. that uh, what what I'm thinking about is like so we are now at this stage yeah. having the you know Aliyev that's here to stay with his approach mm -hmm. uh, and then Pashinyan um, in this context. Um, what is really interesting for me and I think for a lot of people in Azerbaijan, uh, considering the reality as it is uh, without dressing it up in some um, in something, in some beautiful dress or something. Mm -hmm. The, you know, before the war, you know, Armenia actually did want the communication links to open, to open borders with Turkey, etc., etc. Do you think that actually opening the communication links, border with Azerbaijan, border with Turkey, the regional? Um, I mean, is this going to happen or there is some kind of political blockage in Armenia that will not make no, it, it possible? Will happen. It will happen. I don't, think, I don't think Armenia has the wherewithal to resist it. It's important only to uh, think about the parameters of, of how these borders open. For example, what kind of status that uh, link to Nahijevan is going to have, how much control Armenia is going to have, uh, whether it's going to be under Russian control, whatever. I mean, the, the, the parameters are, are very important. They're not just detailed, they're very important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what are going to be the terms of reopening the border with Turkey? Um, is it true that Turkey now is ready to reopen the borders and, and normalize relations? Because, you know, for the last 30 years, the Karabakh conflict um, has been the main obstacle for it. You know, do they consider it settled, or uh, are they going to wait some more? And and also, what kind of what kind of um, elements the document is going to have with regard to reconciliation? Because Turkey might also think that Armenia now is is quite weak, and uh, and uh, you know more demands can be. 
uh, can be issued uh, uh, with regard to the uh, to these protocols and with, with regard to Armenia's positions on, on certain issues having to do with its relations uh, with Turkey. So, but uh, I do think that in the visible future these things are going to happen uh, and uh, it is not up to Armenia uh, to, uh, to, to make it impossible. Uh, if, there is, if there is an agreement between the important regional actors uh, that these, these, these roads need to be opened, these communications need to be opened, uh, then I think that it, it will happen. Again, the only interesting thing is going to be what, what parameters they are, they are going to have. So I want to go back to this topic of, of these new narratives and these myths that mm -hmm. were created in the run-up to the elections yeah. and that now presumably persist yes, within do. Armenian society. And if I understand you correctly, you have implied that these are not constructive. No, they're not. And so what, what needs to happen? What potential is there for these myths and narratives to change into something constructive? Is there a way to really change the political DNA, so to speak, of, of Armenia, given the situation currently? Uh, it's a very painful, painful question for me. Uh, you know, I, I deal with that on a regular basis, and I... I speak out about that uh, in, in different formats in Armenia. I, I think the, the political mythology in Armenia has, has done tremendous amount of damage to that country, certain myths, uh, certain political myths, certain historical myths, etc. They have done uh, tremendous damage um, and they clearly need to be re-examined and uh, they clearly need to be challenged and we need to have a different kind of conversation about that. Now, again, returning to something I already said earlier, wars sometimes have such consequences of challenging these, these, these sort of myths, ideas, they, they, uh, they vividly demonstrate their bankruptcy, right? But uh, that hasn't happened in Armenia. I mean, for a very brief period, there was an opening, and uh, actually even now, it's, it has become a little easier to speak out and to challenge this. But again, it is true that uh, the, the, uh, the main discourse, the majority of people who, who kind of define the narrative, who define the discourse in Armenia, are still wedded to, to certain sets of traditional myths and they have generated new ones on top of them. Now, it is tempting to think of this as a purely intellectual and ideational problem, but they rarely are these things, right? If it was a purely ideational issue, they would have been demolished a long time ago. Uh, these things are sustained because I mean, we have to approach this as a political economy problem, right? There have been, uh, there have been institutions and interests that have sustained, that have been sustained thanks to these myths and challenging and, uh, you know, revising these myths threatens their stability. A lot of people, uh, a lot of people's livelihood essentially depends on the on the sustenance of, of, of this, on the stability of these of these myths. Uh, having said that, uh, I think people who understand um, understand the uh, the dangers of these myths and who are bothered by them. You know they shouldn't they shouldn't get tired and they should they should challenge them and again this is uh, it's it's kind of I mean I, I I can easily be perceived as apologizing for Armenia I mean these myths are bad and they have they have done done damage to others as well but the the primary victim of these myths is Armenia itself I mean this is uh, this is who should be interested. In, in getting uh, in in revising uh, of these myths and uh, and I think it is the it is the job of of scholars and intellectuals uh, those 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 who are not somehow you know um, uh, institutionally 
benefiting or connected uh, to these uh, to these myths, it is it is up to these intellectuals to challenge them, or it's it's up up to everybody to to just examine and and evaluate these myths and um, these these ways of thinking. And uh, you know the the main thing that needs to be done in Armenia in terms of in terms of revising these myths is 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 um, Getting rid of of this uh, commitment to a notion that politics is the stuff of dreams and and aspirations, right? Uh, politics is the stuff of reality, a very hard reality, and uh, and I think uh, I th I think that's. That's the main thing that needs to be changed uh, in, in, in terms of kind of the intellectual approach to politics. Uh, the other stuff will probably follow from it. Arman, um, so it's interesting to, uh, I mean, first of all, I'm, I'm really thankful that you came and we physically met. I think that I remember I've been talking to some uh, EU and uh, German different actors and you know we have been discussing some of ideas that about dialogue and I've heard this opinion that you know these two nations are not ready for dialogue which uh, seemed to me a very wild idea because the idea was not to bring several millions of Azerbaijanis and Armenians at one table but actually to bring together experts, scholars, I mean people whose job it is professionally to prepare their societies, I mean to explore ideas, concepts that could um, sooner or later become a, hopefully a policy of reason uh, based on reason, reality, and not on myths. Um, but let's say, um, let's say there are people in Armenia and Azerbaijan who want to meet even without any mediators, just you know, on their own. Um, how do you see the possibility of such initiatives, and I think there will be many or some people want, but they don't know how to do it. Uh, you know, I've heard, for example, sometimes in Armenia uh, or in Azerbaijan, there are people who say, if Armenians don't do this, then we're not going to meet them. Mm -hmm. Or if Azerbaijanis, you know, uh, keep with Armenian soldiers, like we're never going to meet them, we're never going to talk. Uh, which seems to me a little bit absurd because, you know, uh, even if you consider someone your enemy is uh, the first thing to do is to negotiate right i mean you meet you talk um uh for, for me personally is extremely important to to listen to armenians to learn to study because no matter what i think our, our Azerba many azerbaijans armenians mutually say i think we don't know very much about each other we don't know much about our internal politics which then has huge influence you know on 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 our politics uh, and our destinies uh, shapes us and our future so my question to you is and i think let, let's make it the last question because we have been almost about two hours we're talking how do you think um these initiatives, um, I don't know, this conversation, um, projects, how they should be designed and approached so Armenians who are coming and Azerbaijanis who are coming to meet each other and talk, first of all, like they feel safe, that they are not attacked in Azerbaijan and Armenia, and there is um, no kind of, you know, like, like that we normalize this because no matter if we agree or disagree this is and if even if we don't change our opinions on anything but i think this is you know the most natural and human and logical thing to do but how in your view it should be organized uh, so it actually can work and be productive and efficient and not have this negative heat from both sides because they will be haters from both sides no matter what they will say you know that's a bad idea you so wanna... just to, i just want to add uh, two things to that you know i think really the issue is that there are these 
monolithic perceptions of Azerbaijan and Armenia by you know, the international donors as well as by the people within these societies. And of course, it, it seems obvious that that's not the case, but it also seems that this reality is often forgotten when speaking about the other, and it makes it much easier to then otherize mm -hmm. and consider the other as someone very different when actually there are many more similarities that, um, that exist. So, you know, and also getting to this issue, I think what, what you're asking in part is how do we start this process of normalization, which is what, Armand, you were talking about a little bit earlier. What is the prelude to dialogue? How can there start to be these trusts how can there, how can we start to build trust in interactions so that we can get to the point that there ends up being fruitful dialogue? Well, um, I have a couple of reactions to to these questions. So, first of all, if people are going to fear uh, being called names, uh, they should not bother because uh, people who engage in this process are going to be called names. Uh, people who have conversations like this, um, uh, no, no matter how carefully these conversations are designed and how innocuous they are, they are going to be called names and they are going to be, uh, and there are going to be labels attached to them. So if you fear that, just don't bother. The second point is that uh, people who organize these things, uh, and I don't mean necessarily outsiders or third parties, Armenians and Azerbaijanis who have an idea of getting together and, and talking to each other, they should have some basic, um, you know, uh, a roadmap, kind of uh, rules, rules of the road, basically, just some very basic stuff. I, I'll just mention one, actually, the, the, the one thing that is the most important to me. If anybody is interested in coming to a meeting like this and proving to Azerbaijanis that, you know, the name Azerbaijani didn't exist a hundred years ago, and uh, when Karabakh was Armenian, Azerbaijanis, the ancestors of Azerbaijanis were in still, uh, still in the Altai region, and uh, were, you know, or, or on the opposite side, uh, you know, Yerevan had uh, a sizable Azerbaijani population, and Zangezur is, uh, is, is, I mean, if anybody's interested in, in coming and engaging in this kind of uh, fruitless, pointless uh, exercise in, uh, in virtue signaling to their domestic audiences. Scoring politically. Sco scoring inside. points and, you know, going back home and uh, being patted on the back by old relatives that, you know, they gave it to the Turks or to the Armenians and that sort of thing. These people just should, I mean, you should, we should all keep them out of, of such conversations because it's just pointless. I mean, what's the point of involving them? The second point is, uh, is a subtle one. I mean, we, we cannot expect people not to have feelings, not to have uh, strong feelings, um, grievances, uh, complaints, uh, political views. That's always going to be there. But I think the best thing that they can do, people who think reconciliation is, uh, or, or normalization at least, is, is important, they should approach this not as a contest, not as a way of twisting the other side's arms, proving the rightness of your position, but they should approach this as problem solving. They should be in a mindset that we're, this is our common tragedy and our common problem and we either want to solve it together or we don't, right? And if we want to solve, it, uh, solve a problem, that you should, then you should approach this as, a, as, as an engineer, basically as an engineering problem, right? Uh, not, you know, put emotions aside and think about this as, uh, you know, we're going to save 
save the lives of future soldiers who are going to die. Right? So um, that, that should be the, the mindset and the approach and, uh, and what I said before and the understanding that we really don't have good alternatives and, and, and we, should, we should probably try to find a way. Uh, I, I totally agree with you and I think that I want to add a couple of things uh, because you know I was, I remember it was in 2000s I led two groups of Azerbaijani journalists and civil society leaders mm -hmm. to Yerevan and Sevan Lake. I was working back then as coordinator of Friedrich Hebert Foundation so had the uh, opportunity to, to do that and I so I had some a lot of experiences and a lot of other opportunities to meet Armenians and you know I think we should not also shy away from um, you know also analyzing that experience those initiatives and I think one thing that I think is important when we have this new wave of initiatives hopefully coming and there will be different groups people participating in this, I think it's extremely important not to limit it to the same group of people sure. who always meet each other for the last 30 years. Absolutely. You know? I agree. And um, that is extremely important to break the monopoly of this dialogue. So it's not just Aliyev and Pashinyan who are meeting. It's not just, you know, this peace activist in Armenia and peace activist, you know, in Azerbaijan are meeting, but I think we, we have, you know, really hope for breakthrough here if we can get business people to meet, if we can get scientists to meet, if we can get, you know, uh, young people, like different social groups. Just stay away from historians. <laughs> okay. Except the good ones. Um, Armand, thank you very much thank you. Uh, for thank you, coming to our show. Thank you and I thank you it. for being with us.